Hi everyone, my name is Gail Nakula and uh, I'm an adjunct faculty member here in the School of Public Service with a huge confession. Um, I'm probably the only person in the room who's had experience in all sectors of government. I started out in the city of Virginia Beach and I worked there for three or four years and then went to state government was uh, a state government employee, two different states, Michigan and Virginia, for about 13, 14 years. And then I went to the dark side, to the feds, and was there for 30 years. So um, that said, to me, local government is the place to be. Local government is where you can work most closely with your constituents, where you can see the results of your initiatives, where you can actually work with <clears throat> residents of your municipality, whether it's a town or a city or a county, and see the results of democracy, small d democracy in action. So I'm a real fan of local government. Um, I teach a course on civic engagement, and I'm pretty passionate about that, both in the academic world and in my um, private life. I believe in engaging with my community, both in my neighborhood, my city, and my region. Um, so what we're going to do is have the opportunity for the next 50 minutes or so to meet and talk with, and, and you have the opportunity to ask questions of, three very impressive local government officials. Mr. Terry O'Neill, who he may, may not know this, but I consider him a personal friend because he comes and talks to my civic engagement class and has done so for the last, what, three years, four years or so. Um, Terry is the Director of Community Development for the City of Hampton. And Ms. Michelle Smith, who I've just met recently, is the Director of Norfolk, Norfolk's Criminal Justice Services. And Michelle is a doctoral student in the uh, PhD program uh, School of Public Service here at ODU. And Ms. Jillian Pittman, who is a brand new 2017 graduate of the MPA program in the School of Public Service here at ODU. And Jillian is a marketing research specialist in economic development for the city of Chesapeake. So we have a really nice wide range of uh, experiences and opportunities, and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves to you all first. So Michelle, if you would start, tell, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and how you came to this very challenging position that you hold? Well, good morning, everybody. It's still morning. Mm -hmm. I am, first of all, I am a native Norfolkian. So I just want to say that up front. Um, I went to school in Virginia Tech, and the only thing I really wanted to do was to come back home and work for my city. So I came back home, and it didn't really work out that way. However, I started working out at the sheriff's office, working at the sheriff's office, and actually I started out as an executive assistant to the chief deputy there. So really my major was urban affairs, so I was going to come back to the city and I was going to plan, help plan the city and help with all these things, urban affairs, and you know, but I ended up in criminal justice. And once I worked at the sheriff's office as an executive assistant, um, the city actually took over my agency, Norfolk Criminal Justice Services. So we sort of, well, I won't say merge, but the city took it over and I became a local government. So I work for the sheriff's office and, and we're, we're talking about two separate entities here because the sheriff's office, sheriff is a constitutional officer, right? And so the city sort of went over 
I'm sorry. So my agency actually went over to the city of Norfolk probably two years after I started working there. And hence, I began working in, in local government. So that's my start. I've been there ever since. I've been in local government for 20 plus years. Thanks, Michelle. Terry? Well, I, uh, I mean, I think I was uh, preordained to go work in public service. My entire family, from my father, mother, all my siblings, all worked in public service. I think, uh, you know, over the dinner table, it just sort of seeped into our genes. So that's, uh, that's um, I've always said that's really, you know, how, how I got to be that way. Um, um, certainly a big influence on my life was my older brother, who um, I'm biased, but I think is one of the really um, brilliant minds in local government in the country. And so I always sort of took his lead and so um so that's always big a, been a big influence and uh, when i went away to school my major was in architecture so um i originally thought i was going to be an architect and i actually worked in that profession for a little while but um then i got a phone call from my brother and he uh let me know that there was an opportunity for me to come back to my hometown and served my city and practiced my profession. And I took that opportunity, not really thinking I would be there 35 years later, which I have been there ever since. So, um, so that's, my, that's my journey. Thank you. Jillian, how about you? Um, I have less of a romantic story than that. <laughs> but, um, so I graduated from Virginia Tech um, for my undergrad as well. Go Hokies. Go Hokies. So um, we're all three Hokies. Oh, yeah. awesome. We've got another one back there. Oh. <laughs> awesome. Um, and then somehow I ended up coming to Norfolk. Um, I wanted to do this master's program in order to get into nonprofit work, actually. Um, and by luck of chance, I just, the right programs and the right internship, I ended up at my... Um, my job right now in the city of Chesapeake Economic Development. And I've been there for about a year, so I have a little less experience, but I'm just, I'm, I love it now, so that's my story. I think that's great. I, I love the range of experience that we, that we have on this panel, and uh, let's probe that a little bit more. So, Jillian, would you talk about your agency, your organization? Sure. Um, so I work in economic development for the city of Chesapeake. Um, our main goal really is to attract business to our city, um, make it, you know, so our workforce is suitable for companies to move in, um, find them the right property site. We also um, maintain relationships with our existing businesses in order to um, meet their needs and, you know, hopefully expand their business in our city. Um, and I'm the marketing researcher, so I, my tasks vary. I, you know, do marketing, so I do newsletters, um, host events, but also um, crunch numbers for annual reports, so my job varies, but that's what economic development does. Okay, and in your department, um, are you uh, one of the only um, people with an MPA, or no? Um, how does that work? Actually, the my coworker before me, she graduated from the program as well, um, just a few years in the master's program. So okay, and would there be people in your department, for example, that I'd have a master's in econ or a master's in marketing, um, a some lot other of, fields, a lot of planning. Um, urban and environmental planning. Um, we collaborate with the planning department a lot, so that's vital. But um, educational background, it can really vary. We have a finance person working our budget. Um, we have, you know, a business development manager that loves to, you know, um, event plan. So that's like her little niche. So everyone okay. has their little niche in okay. our department. So okay. our our backgrounds vary. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something that's really critical to mm -hmm. all of our cities, and that's workforce development. And 
maybe we can talk about that a, a little bit later in this panel. Um, is that something I think that everybody is concerned with? Terry, tell us about your department. So the community development department is um, uh, 64 people. So I manage 64 people. We're, we, I like to say our responsibility is from everything from long range strategic planning in the city. So we have a division that's focused purely on that all the way to uh, building construction, giving somebody a certificate of occupancy, opening their building. And then there's also a couple of um, relatively unique aspects to our department in our housing and neighborhood division. And we also are in community development are responsible for zoning property maintenance. Um, the, resili the resiliency efforts in Hampton are kind of centered in our, our department as well. And as Gail knows, we also um, staff kind of a unique group of people in our youth commission. So that's, that's kind of a unique um, um, aspect of what we do. So, so my department is very broad. Uh, we do lots of things uh, in old structures of local government in Hampton Roads. Many of those functions I just mentioned were all separate departments. And so as governments have gone through various, uh, you know, reorganization and trying to figure out how to streamline and maximize efficiency, all of those departments have ended up with me. So, um, so that's what we do. And Terry, how many people does the city of Hampton uh, employ? About 2,500. 2,500, okay. Jillian, do you have any idea how many um, just people, any chance? Between 2,500 and 3,000. Okay. Michelle, any idea what? You said about 3,000? 5,000. 5,000? Okay, 5,000. Mm -hmm. So, Michelle, our criminal justice uh, expert. Tell us about your department, your agency. So my agency, Norfolk Criminal Justice Services, there are two divisions. We have a pretrial services division, and we have a local probation division. A lot of people are like, what is that? What is, what is pretrial services? So we are a community corrections agency. And I say agency and not department. And I want to sort of distinguish between the two. So when you say department, most of that money, most of the funding that they get, for their fiscal year is coming from the general fund. Most of my funding is actually coming from the state. However, we do receive some funding from the city and we are considered a city agency. So that's sort of the difference between the two. But we're a community corrections agency and pre-child services is basically a program that supervises people, defendants, who are charged with crimes, but for whatever reason, the only reason they're in the jail, in our city jails, is because they really can't afford bail. So we submit reports um, to the courts to allow judges to make more informed bail decisions. If judges feel that um, we, and actually, we look at risk. We look at risk for failure to appear in court. So if judges feel that, okay, this person, you know, is actively working, there's a family that's dependent on income, there are a lot of things that judges really look at. And if they feel that this person um, is not a risk to public safety and that there's a high likelihood that they're going to return to court, then they're placed under our supervision until the total disposition of their case. Now, the local probation division, and most people in here have heard of probation, but you probably mostly heard of state probation and parole. And there's a difference between local and state. And the difference is the charge. And more than likely, if it's a felony offense, it's going to be state probation and parole. Because usually with local probation, we supervise those folk who are convicted for a charge in which they would spend their time in our local jail. So there's a difference between jails and prisons as well. Jails are local, prisons are not. So that's what we do. We supervise these individuals and, and pretty much most of our clients, all of them are Norfolk residents. So we get a whole lot of people who are transferring to this area. Some of them are college students, <laughs> you know, more so than we would like them to be college students. 
but they're Norfolk residents. So that's what we do. Thank you. So so diverse, uh, just mm -hmm. in this panel, and and really, uh, there are so many other departments that uh, cities have uh, purview over. So we're just you're just seeing a bit of what uh, the kind of breadth of city government deals with. Just a tiny, you know. And now I'd like to say just one more thing. We are diverse <coughs> here, but we link in some way or other from workforce development to zoning and resilience to what I do. Because once again, these are residents, our clients. Right. So at some point, in some way, we're going to link. Right. And that, that's the interesting part about it all. Right. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. And... Um, Just be as frank as as you you can be, uh, so that the the students uh, both here and online, and that Ron shows the video too in his in his classes, will have a, a better understanding of why working for city government is a fabulous career. Okay, so the first question: What experiences? Uh, either in school, and Jillian, you're a little closer to the school experience than, you know, maybe Michelle and, and Terry are, but what experiences, school or otherwise, best prepared you to be an effective representative of your city, an effective city official? I can speak on um, okay. my educational perspective. Okay. Okay. Um, my experience through the MPA program has been extremely valuable to um, my local government career, um, especially jump-starting it. <laughs> I worked a few semesters as a grad assistant in the department. Um, it was interesting, you know, researching for professors and getting to know and making those connections. But then I continued on to my internship program, which was a requirement of the program in order to graduate. Um, and that's where I really got to, you know, get the hands-on experience in local government and see every, the day-to-day -day, um, functions. So I think that is, I wouldn't say it's the, it, it probably was the most valuable part of the program was that requirement in order to get out there. Um, the internship. So, yes. Okay. Um, okay. We, we encourage internships as well. We just had one this summer. Um, so every summer we try to get people from um, from the ODU program, but from other college students as well. Um, so I would say that has been significant in jump starting my career. Okay. Who else? Terry, you wanna? Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, I would say, you know, I, we're, I think we're always learning, so, it's, I'm sure there are experiences early in my career that I can think of, you know, that were um, sort of transformational for me. But it, it seems like there's something like that that occurs along the way all the time, you know. And so I'll just touch on a couple. Um, you know, one was I was very fortunate at a very early age in my public service career to be tapped to be on a sort of a special task force in the city as Hampton was really sort of diving into um, civic engagement and conflict resolution in a community, in a diverse community. And so I got some very, very early training that really changed my mind as to how you um, come to conclusions in, a, in an environment like local government where you heard from the panel, the earlier panel is just so diverse and so complex. Um, like most people, I walked into a career, as the panel before us said, thinking that, you know, A plus B, there's a, you know, equal C, and that's, there's a, there's a clear right and wrong answer. Well, you find out very quickly that's not true. There's just shades of good, better, and best, usually, and you have to find, you know, the one that is going to bring people together and everybody can live with, and so 
that experience changed completely the way I saw my job, my work, um, and how I made decisions. Um, um, probably the next one after that was when I was tapped to be the director of the department. Uh, at the time, I was the youngest director in the city. And I can tell you I was woefully unprepared to walk into that. I thought I was, but I was woefully unprepared to walk into that job. And, um, and so I made a commitment to myself going forward that I was going to do everything in my power to prepare other people in my department not to have that experience so that when they got their opportunity to do that. And so my point in that is that um, I think developing leadership skills at every level of an organization, not just the person who sits in the corner office, is really a powerful thing from a personal development perspective, but it also does amazing things for your organization as well. And then the last one was um, another rare opportunity I got is um, I got selected to go um, to assist some, a community in South Africa as they were going through the transition from the apartheid regime of government to a democratic government and got to experience the fact that all of the things that we take for granted as a democratic form of government, they were completely unaware of or had no background or experience and were trying to recreate it from the ground up. And yet their sort of appreciation and attitude for, for becoming involved in local government and having a voice and having avenues to participate um, all of which I think we take way too much for granted was such a powerful impression on me that, um, you know, that I really wanted to make sure that in any way, shape, or form, you know, what little ways I could make that happen in my community or in my region, that I would, I would do everything I could to figure out new and better ways to do that. So, so I think those are just three examples of, of things that I think have really shaped kind of where I am now. Okay. Michelle? So because I'm still a student, there, you know, my perspective in this answer is going to probably be more so of a, of a mentor speaking to a mentee, since this is an academic uh, audience. So I want to say that outside of work, and one of our first panelists sort of mentioned this. Um, I was an active citizen. So what I mean is that I was a part of organizations that were very active in the Norfolk community. So m my point here is whether you are a homeowner here, whether you use rent, Become an active citizen. Now, you may not be here. Once you graduate, you may leave and go somewhere else. But while you're here, find out about your civic league. Involve yourself in some of the things that you're doing in the community. A lot of times, city council members are at these civic league meetings. So definitely involve yourself um, in your community. Also, and there are four, I have four points here. Also, plan your courses strategically, okay? So even if, so I, I always like to say, most of the people in my office have criminal justice degrees, besides myself, and criminal justice master's degree. But my thing is, diverse your portfolio. Tell people this all the time. So be strategic in choosing your courses. So don't just stay within your concentration or anything like that. Diversify, go outside. When I, when I found out I was getting a certificate here at ODU, and once I found out that, that my school was doing an, an actual uh, special lecture series where the current city manager was actually teaching the course, which was Regina Williams at the time, and my thing is, hmm, I finished my hours for my certificate, but Regina Williams is teaching this course and I work for her and she does not know me. But if I take her course, she will. She's gonna know how I write them. Make sure your stuff is tight, <laughs> your writing and everything. She's gonna know. So when I took that course, every department head came for a session. So that allowed students to network, 
you know, if you wanted to go into lo local government, you know, here are people to talk to, here's why. And also there was a budget course during the same lecture series where Marcus Jones, who was then the budget director and then who later became city manager, he was teaching budgeting. And I'm like, Marcus, I, you know, I do a lot of things where Marcus has to sign off on it. I know Marcus Jones, but Marcus Jones doesn't know me, but he will know me <laughs> after this course. So sort of go outside. When, a uni when you see these emails, a lot of these emails where the universities have special series or in your department or even outside of your department where they may have special, special lecture series where there are people who you really feel who could benefit your career, especially in, in local government, go, participate. It can, it can only really help you. And I think the last thing, I don't know if that's the first thing. Jillian talked about internships. A lot of programs have internships. So I will tell you that we take interns who take it as a course, right? You get credit for it due to the accountability, due to the accountability of the student, right? The student is accountable to the university for the amount of hours that they must do. You have a much better chance of doing it that way than you will walking in off of the street after you graduate, right? Because we're all, we're looking at, you know, from a from my perspective, we're also looking at liability. I'd rather for the ODU to have liability for their student who's enrolled in this course than for us to have the liability. But internships are highly important. Norfolk has a municipal internship, I believe, every year and other internships. And, and I'm here to tell you, most of those students come out with jobs and a lot of them have executive level positions in local government. So that's what I would say. <coughs> If we have enough time at the end, I want to come back to something that, a theme that I'm hearing, and that's the idea of being a mentor and having a mentor. So kind of keep that at the back of your mind. Um, I have over 40 years of experience, as I mentioned, in all three sectors of government. In all that time, I really feel that I only had one mentor, and that was in my my you know, the last, the last part of my career. Um, but I think that's, that's really important. So be thinking about that and we'll try and come back. Um, so what aspect of working for city government were you least prepared for? What surprised you the most about working for city government is another way of putting that um, I had a lot of surprises a lot of surprises okay <laughs> okay what, what were those surprises um, you know just like in my program just reading through textbooks you see you know those like highlighted terms and definitions but you actually see that when you're working in local government um like red tape <laughs> You know, the whole Red bureaucracy. Red tape became real to you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. You have to consider city council, um, the city manager, department heads, an authority board. Um, and not to say there isn't discretion in your work. You can find your creative voice. But um, major decisions ultimately come back to serving the people and serving the business community. Um I, another surprise is the amount of FOIA requests that come through. Okay, let's that's, that's stop right there. You want to explain what FOIA is oh, for some of these people who might not know? The Freedom of Information Act. Okay. Um, so we got a lot of, you know, residents that want information, request information, and economic development is, I guess, a little special in that we have to work as the liaison between Chesapeake residents and the business community or the corporate citizens of our city. Um, so that's been interesting and I enjoy it. You know, it's, there's issues, but that's part of the job. Um, I think the best surprise has been coming into work and, you know, having a different schedule every day. It's so different. Um, I think <coughs> some of the panelists have mentioned that you have to be diverse. You have to be adaptable. Um, and you just have to situate yourself in different situations and different you have to know your audience as well. Um, some days I'm just sitting at my desk crunching numbers. Um, some days 
or yesterday I attended a ribbon cutting ceremony um, and tomorrow I'm gonna be working the Chesapeake Wine Festival so it's it's different you know like a different type of work but um, yeah, that's been I think the best surprise so far okay mm -hmm. so less routine so what was in the textbook became real right came to fruition. and then diversity mm -hmm. was... being able to adapt and be flexible okay, okay. Mm -hmm. What else, Terry? What were some of those pleasant or unpleasant surprises that you encountered? I would say probably the probably the biggest one is just how complicated the work we do is. Um, you know, I think everybody sort of comes into it thinking it's it's very linear in terms of how it operates, and it's it could be no further from the truth. It's. Mm -hmm. It's really a very complex, uh, if you think of a city, it's a very complex organism. And, um, you know, it makes everything, you know, I, to some degree I call it controlled chaos. You know, we, we live in a very chaotic environment. Mm -hmm. You know, the last couple of days, for example, you know, you, you have your normal job and then you find out there's a storm coming and to, to the discussion at the first panel then, you know, my job changes from being the community development director is now I'm in charge of damage assessment. So that, that changed in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's stories like that I'm sure we all could tell. So, you know, the fact that it's very complex, very fluid, very complicated. Um, and yet at the same time, I think you've heard panelists both earlier and on our panel say it's very challenging. You're never bored. And that's been one of the biggest, you know, sort of, if, if, if you're wired that way, that you want to be in a very challenging, rewarding place, then I think local government, I, I, you know, I think it's probably the place to be because, um, you know, at the end of the day, the rewards you get from it are pretty amazing. Um, you know, and probably we don't have enough time to tell all those stories, but it's, you know, there's, there's lots of days you can drive around your community knowing that you've put your heart and soul into something and feel really, really good about what you see or people come up to you in the grocery store and say you've made it, you know, you've had an impact in their family's lives because of certain things. So. Yeah, yeah. Michelle? So I'm going to be frank. Okay. <laughs> My first surprise, I think I was, I was, I was very surprised when I first started um, I was surprised at the border issues that sometimes dwell amongst our city departments. And Ger Gareth Morgan, for the students here, Gareth Morgan wrote a book called Images of Organizations in which he assigns a metaphor to organizations. And I saw local government as a machine and in a machine, you have all these gears and parts that all work together. And without these gears and parts, if one malfunction, then, you know, you can't get anything else done. It's, it stops, you know. So you have these gears and all of these parts. And what I found is that sometimes border issues, and when I say border, and I don't know whether they're due to resources, you know, lack of resources, staff shortages, and things like that. Sometimes border barriers, borders create barriers, they're bar barriers to other departments or agencies getting things done. And my surprise was, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all here for the same thing, right? Quality service delivery to our citizens, right? To our residents, right? Guys, we all have one purpose, right? <laughs> you know, but you encounter these issues. So what I found that was important which was mentioned earlier, was the importance of relationships and building relationships amongst departments and people so that you can figure out ways to sort of get around some of these border issues so that ultimately we can get that quality service delivery right. to our residents. So I think that was, that was the first shock for me because I'm like, okay, guys, we're all here for the same thing, right? Why aren't we all working together? Right. So, you know, you have to sort of find a way to sort of get around that in government. Right. And I don't, I don't think that can really be overemphasized for, for those of you who are in the 
in the room and for those of you who are online, the fiefdoms, the stovepiping, the reluctance to share, certainly not always, but certainly sometimes. These are realities, not just in city government, though. I want to make that point at all levels of government. And so one of the things that we talk about in one of my classes is, is cross-boundary organizations and working cross-boundary and the importance of that. So thank you so much for bringing up that point. That is, it's frank and it's real. And I think that um, those of us who have had experience working at whatever government level have seen that for sure. Um, I'm just going to add a little personal story. When I, I was 24 years old, um, my first job, City of Virginia Beach, and within six months of uh, having that job, I had to fire somebody. The person I had to fire was older than I was. Uh, she was a Navy spouse. She was melting down in front of me for various and sundry reasons. And I have to tell you, I was totally unprepared. So personnel issues are, are some of the issues that you will be least prepared for and are the hardest issues to face. I still remember this incident, even though it was years and years and years ago. I ended up taking her to Sewell's Point Clinic which is a Navy, the Navy, local Navy clinic, um, after I, I gave her the news that she was no longer employed. And I'll never forget that. And you can never be prepared for something like that. Any, any similar experiences that, that you all have had? Well, not only that, but just, you know, having to, I would say personnel issues. I deal with those more so than I think anything. And that was a surprise, like how much I would be dealing with personnel issues. Yeah. And I said, well, why? Why can't people just come to work and do their jobs? But, you know, we did. I deal with more personnel issues than yeah. I would like to. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a surprise, the amount of personnel issues that, yeah. that we deal with. Yeah. Well, I, I agree, but I, I maybe I'll take a little bit different twist on this. I, I think it simply points out in an organization, whether it's local government or any other organization, that you know one of those skills that I suspect none of us get a lot of is how do you build an organization and how do you build a team? You know, I have sixty-four people, and that's sixty-four different personalities that walk in the door in the morning that need different things from me as the director of that department. And, um, you know, if you're going to, to be, you know, a high performing organization that maybe limits how many times you have to deal with personnel issues, you have to invest an incredible amount of time, you know, in building, you know, the, the right culture and the trusting organization that's going to perform well, because at the end of the day, you know, my performance, in the eyes of my bosses and the community are going to depend on those 64 people right. and feeling like that they're, you know, they're aligned in terms of what their mission is and how they're treated and they're going to, they're going to be supported and all of those kinds of things. So if you can create that, you you can hopefully minimize how many times you have to go through the really awful experience of having to deal with a personnel issue. Right. Right. Okay, well, in the interest of time, we'll move on to our last question. I still have that idea of if we can talk about being a mentor or having a mentor, we'll, we'll get back to that. But um, what characteristics do effective local government officials need to have, either by disposition or by education or by experience to succeed? And, Michelle, I'd like to start with you this time, if I could. Sure. Um when you first sent that question, you know, I really thought about, to me, I think the most important thing that anyone can have, especially if you're in a leadership position, is self-assessment. So the, the ability 
to actually perform a self-assessment before you make a, a decision. Knowing that whatever position you may be in, that position is going to have an effect. It's going to affect other people. It's going to affect your department. It's going to affect yourself. So, you know, and I say this and people just say, Michelle, really? I have a mirror that I keep behind my door. And whenever I have to make any type of decision, I close the door and I'm looking at myself. This is my, this is my self-assessment. Michelle, is, will this, how will this decision affect others? Is it within policy? Is it ethical? Are there any emotions, personal emotions, involved in this decision? You know, so I go through all these steps before I make a decision. So I think it's really important for people to, and I, and, and I will say it's an art to self-assess because it's hard. It's hard to look at ourselves and within ourselves when we're making decisions. So I said the ability to self-assess first um, is a good trait. Also listening. And I do some adjunct instruct, instruction where I have these, and I, I, I forget what class it's from. They're these talking sticks. And the talking sticks said, um, they say, make sure that you, I believe it's understand before you're understood. So in class, I have these talking sticks that say, okay, let me make sure I'm understanding what you're saying before I talk. So, you know, and that takes listening in order to understand. So I believe one of our first panelists talked about just being a good listener, being humble. You know, in the first session, we heard that a deputy city manager, you know, when the mayor asked for a glass of water, they got that glass of water. If I'm in between cleaning contracts and someone needs to dump the trash and it's me, then Michelle is dumping the trash in her good clothes. <laughs> so other people can see. And, and it really does serve as an example for the people you are leading. So... But self-assessment will be my first one. Okay, self-assessment. I think that that's a great approach. Who else? Terry? Well, I, I, would, I would agree on humility. I think it's a, a, a really huge trait if you're going to be successful in public service uh, for all the reasons everybody's talked about. Um, I think being a, a principled person, which was brought up in the first panel, is really, really important. Um, you're going to get, if you stay in this career long enough, you're going to get push and pulled and, you know, influenced um, or try to be influenced in all kinds of different ways. And, and you really have to stay the course. Um, and I think, you know, you have to, I think the other word I would use is you have to be, you know, really visionary. Um, that doesn't mean this giant vision necessarily of you know, of an organization or as a city as a whole, although that helps. But I think you have you have to have your own vision about how it fits into that and keep to it. That's your North Star. That's your compass. You know, and, and again, I go back to you're going to walk in the door every day in local government and you're going to get pushed and pulled on as soon as you walk in the door in 14, 15, 50 different directions in a day. And you have to have a really strong compass to know how you're going to navigate. Otherwise, I think you're going to get lost along the way. And my last one is, um, and again, I can't take credit for this. I learned this when I, you know, got that very early training in civic engagement and conflict resolution, and it always stuck with me that you have to be hard on the issues but easy on the people. Um, and I've tried to live by that all along the way because it's really not about the people most of the time, but people make issues personal. And you have to somehow have to figure out a way to rise above that and just focus, be hard on the issue, but be easy on the people. And that serves me, I think, pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think for a good local city official, um, just being able to step back and ask questions. 
um, look, I guess that goes with your mentorship. Um, go to a colleague or your boss and establish a relationship, um, someone that can show you the ropes. I came into economic development having no idea what that meant. <laughs> so um, it, I'm lucky enough to have a great staff. We have a pretty small staff, just 12 of us, but um, we're very close knit. Mm -hmm. So that's been great, establishing a mentorship. Um, also, the willingness to serve and really, I guess, to stay humble and remember who you're working for. Um, it's extremely satisfying. So if you enjoy helping your community, it's great. Um, seeing a project from infancy to um, the ribbon cutting is amazing. And seeing business owners, you know, fulfill their lifelong dreams sometimes. Um, so that's been extremely satisfying. Um, so you do have to have that sense of not all days are good. <laughs> You're going to get um, angry residents sometimes, but that's, that's your job. Okay. So self-assessment, have a vision, a strong compass, a moral compass, yeah. Uh, the importance of humility, which our, our first panel discussed, um, being uh, hard on the issues but easy on the people. The importance of asking questions, certainly if you don't understand, uh, you don't have to understand everything. You're not expected to understand everything. Right. You should be asking questions. And another little personal experience, um, when your boss tells you that you are responsible from now and until you leave this job for letting him know if he has broccoli in his teeth, <laughs> Before he speaks in public, take that seriously. He means it. <laughs> so, um, thank you all. I just want to, before we end up, I'm going to take 60, 75 seconds. Michelle, did you have a mentor? Are you mentoring anybody? Oh, goodness. I've had <coughs> numerous mentors in different departments. Um, and some outside of local government. So yes, and yeah, I have numerous children. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I don't have any of my own. So all of my mentees are considered my children. Yeah. So yes. So it's I important. Do. It is It is so important. Yeah. Jillian, do you have a mentor? Um, I would say I have a few in different capacities within my department. Um, mentees, I had a brief one this summer, <laughs> my first intern, so okay. that was extremely satisfying. Okay. Yeah. okay, so helping an intern to, yeah. to grow and learn. Mm -hmm. All right, and Terry? Well, and for the sake of time, I mean, my certainly my <laughs> brother has been my mentor throughout my career, and so could, couldn't ask for a better one. Um, yeah, and as, you know, as a director of a large department, I... I think it's my responsibility to try to be there for people. Um, as I mentioned, you know, they all need something different. And, you know, I'm, uh, as Michelle said, I'm, I, it's hard to be self-aware sometimes. I know I'm not perfect for all of them all the time, but, you know, you try to do your best. And, you know, I have people in my department that look up to me starting at age 15 all the way to, wherever the oldest person is in the department. Um, so it's it's quite a challenge, but it's it's something I enjoy, and uh, hopefully I do a good job with it. Yeah. So keep that in mind. Being a mentor and having somebody to mentor, those are important aspects. Thank you all. This has been wonderful. I've learned so much. Thank you.